Good evening and welcome to the St. Louis Zoo on this kind of stormy evening. I think the rain will end before you leave, so should be fine for driving home. My name is Jim Jordan, and it's my honor to be connected with a science seminar series that we co-sponsor with the Academy of Science for so many years. Um, this is the last one for 2009, and I'd like to mention a couple programs that we have coming up in the early part of 2010 before we move on to tonight's program. We have a pro or series called Conservation Conversations that features field research with the zoo and other conservation work dealing with wildlife in the local area. Uh, Steve Bircher, our curator of mammals, of carnivores, works with cheetah conservation in Africa. And he'll be presenting a program Tuesday, January 26, called Race for Survival, Cheetahs in Peril. We have another one, Undertaking Conservation, the Recovery of the American Burying Beetle, which is a unique species in which they, this small beetle looks for animal carcasses and buries them and then lays their eggs to provide a nice, nutritious meal for their larvae when they hatch out. But it's an endangered species here in North America, and we're involved with the recovery program for that. That'll be on Tuesday, February 16th. Our next science seminar series, we're skipping the month of January, but moving into the beginning of February, is brought to you by Dr. Pamela Gay from SIU Edwardsville, and it's citizen science from cosmos to cornflowers. And Citizen science is an activity that a lot of people have become involved in recently, and it's a great way that we as a general layperson can contribute to science by making observations from birds to frogs. Uh, some people may have heard of the great backyard bird count. Uh, that's one that a lot of people are involved in. We're starting up work on doing bumblebee censuses, so moving into the world of invertebrates. And Dr. Gay will be talking about all the contributions that citizen science makes to the world of science. So we hope that you can join us in 2010. And with that, I'd like to introduce Rose Jansen from the Academy of Science for tonight's program. Good evening, my name is Rose, and I'm with the Academy of Science, and I'm glad you were all able to come out tonight. It's a little wet outside. Um, and as Jim said, we're very pleased to be partnering with the zoo on this long-running and popular science seminar series. Uh, many of you are Academy members and friends, and for those of you who are not familiar with us, I'm gonna take just a couple minutes to tell you a little bit about who we are, and to mention a couple additional upcoming public science seminars that you might have an interest in attending. Uh, we're a local nonprofit. We've been serving the St. Louis community and surrounding counties since 1856. We have a long-standing mission to advance the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. And we continue to celebrate more than 150 years of community service by offering a very broad range of free and low-cost public science programming, collaborative seminar series, and trips and tours that highlight science at venues throughout the region. And you can find more information on the Academy and our community-wide events and programs by visiting our website at academyofsciencestl.org, or there is information on the visitor's desk outside the auditorium. Feel free to pick up any of that and take that along with you before you head out tonight. Uh, if you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy and St. Louis Zoo public lectures and events, there will be a couple e-news sign-up sheets that'll make their way around the audience. Uh, and as well outside uh, the auditorium this evening. Uh, we won't share your name with any other organizations. And we'll have stickers as well that will be available uh, following tonight's talk for any students who need to verify attendance. Uh, next week, Thursday, 10 a.m. at the Center of Clayton, Washington University anthropology professor Dr. Shante Parikh talks about her research on gender and HIV risk in Uganda and the social and economic context that surround the AIDS epidemic. On Tuesday evening, December 15th,
at the Missouri History Museum and in conjunction with the traveling exhibition Treasure. Egyptologist Professor Bill Needle talks about treasures from the ancient world, tales of an early American Egyptologist. And there is a Missouri connection, but I won't tell you what that is. You'll have to attend. Uh, as Jim mentioned, new this year for us is another public science seminar series in partnership with the zoo, Conservation Conversations. So on January 26, here in the auditorium, uh, carnivore, zoo carnivore curator Steve Bircher talks about cheetahs in peril. And there's much more in January, including a climate change panel discussion, which is part of an academy, Kirkwood School District pioneering science seminar series. Uh, middle and high school students who attend three to five pioneering science seminars and write about their experience are eligible to compete for one of two $250 college scholarships, and those will be awarded in May 2010. Um, and again, you can find information on these and even more science opportunities for students and adults at our website or in the literature outside the auditorium at the visitor's desk on your way out this evening. So with that said, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Michael Roberts. Dr. Roberts earned his undergraduate degree in botany and his PhD in plant physiology and biochemistry from Oxford University in Oxford, England. He is currently the Curator's Professor of Animal Science and Biochemistry with the Christopher S. Bond Life Sciences Center at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Dr. Roberts was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1996 and in 2005 was listed as one of Scientific American's top 50 for his accomplishments in research and technological leadership. He has received numerous honors and awards for his work and is the author of over 270 published papers in refereed scientific journals and over 70 reviews and chapters in books. His lab at the University of Missouri-Columbia conducts research in four main areas, transcriptional control of interferon tau genes, whose protein products play a crucial role in establishing communication between the conceptus and mother during early pregnancy of cattle, utilizing human embryonic stem cells as models for trophoblast differentiation, the manner in which maternal diet can influence the sex of offspring in mice and livestock species, and tonight's topic, creation of induced pluripotent stem cells, meaning they have the potential to develop into more than one type of mature cell, from pig embryonic fibroblasts by reprogramming. Won't you please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Dr. Michael Roberts, for a fascinating look at science on the frontiers of biochemistry. Now let me see if I can cope with this. I think it's on there. Ooh, yes. Whenever I talk about stem cells, um, I like to show this particular slide. It's the building in which I work. It's called the Bond, Christopher Bond Life Sciences Center at the University of Missouri. And I show it on a, uh, with a storm coming up behind it. And at the time of the uh, vote on the constitutional uh, uh, referendum uh, three years or so ago, and since then, you're probably aware that stem cells are a fairly controversial topic in Missouri. In fact, uh, because I worked with human embryonic stem cells, I have to, by law, register every year. And you may remember the campaign that was waged ferociously on both sides as to whether uh, that amendment would get onto the Constitution. Um, there was over $25 million spent in the first two years following that, the only person who was registered to use human embryonic stem cells in the state of Missouri was, my, was me, uh, which is a, sort of an interesting uh, phenomenon. It's not a, a topic which has been pursued very heavily in Missouri, uh, but nevertheless, it's still a very controversial one. I should assure you, I also work with the stem cells that are approved and were approved actually in 2001 by uh, President Bush. And in fact, my first slide uh, shows one of those uh, stem cell colonies here called H1, which was developed at the University of Wisconsin. 
and my interest in these is that I can convert these into placental cells uh, but it's not that I'm going to talk to you about tonight what I want to do is to give you some background on embryonic stem cells uh, tell you what they are what they're capable of and some of this you'll have heard before Ooh. see if I can get that quiet um, and then I, I, I w want to move into this new area of induced pluripotent stem cells where as the title indicated it's possible to get cells that are very much like embryonic stem cells but in a way that doesn't involve embryos um, to begin with then let's talk about embryonic stem cells and other sorts of stem cells and uh, this is just a, a, a diagram which in, in a sort of illustrates uh, the various kinds of stem cells that are found in human, although we're showing here a tree. What we have here at the bottom is an oocyte, an egg from a mouse or from any mammal. Uh, after it's fertilized, it goes through a series of cell divisions until it forms uh, what's called a blastocyst. This uh, fertilized egg, the zygote, is capable of developing into the entire body of the animal. It's therefore set to be totipotent. By the time it reaches the blastocyst, it's already gone, uh, divided into two types of cell. The cells around the outside of this structure that would become the placenta, the so-called trophoblast cells, and the cells here which are called the inner cell mass that will ultimately become the fetus proper and these cells will give rise to all the 280 or what, whatever number, it's something like that, different sorts of cells that are found in the mammalian body. So as one goes up this tree, these lineages form and these are the branches here, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, the so-called three main types of cell there that are found in the body of a mammal, including the human. And then as one goes out towards the tip, we get highly specialized cells. So we have, as we get along on this way, these cells have become more and more specialized, more and more differentiated, and less capable of, 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 of becoming cells in another of the uh, branches of this tree. If one looks at the human body with its more hundred, I hear 250 cell types, it's very clear that there is not only a tremendous diversity in cell types, but many of these cell types are continually proliferating. Cells of the skin, for example, are always being sloughed off. Hair cells, similarly, uh, are, uh, as we can see, uh, being lost continuously. We have from the intestine cells that have been sloughed off uh, during, the, during its function. And in the bone marrow, of course, uh, red blood cells, for example, only last about four months. So they're continually being renewed, continuously being renewed. And even in the brain, there are cells that are, are dying and being replaced, although probably this uh, occurs with less frequency as we age. But nevertheless, there is a population of cells in, within all these organs and within the tissues that can give rise to new cells and these therefore are known as stem cells usually more frequent uh, more commonly now known as adult stem cells so what are stem cells well adult stem cells has the ability to divide asymmetrically if you have a stem cell it clearly has to, if it's got, that population is going to remain, you have to keep a cell there that still is a stem cell. But then it gives rise to uh, cells progeny um, that will give rise to other uh, more specialized progenitor cells which is committed to the new tissue. And there are two types of adult stem cell essentially, unipotent, those would be the ones right at the tips of those branches of that tree and then lineage specific stem cells and then multipotent stem cells these are the ones that will give rise to several different kinds of, of, of differentiated cell type but the third type which is the one I'm going to concentrate on over the next few minutes 
are embryonic stem cells. And these are, as I said earlier, considered to be pluripotent because they can give rise to many different cell lineages. Uh, in the case, of, say, of the blastocyst, that inner cell mass, which is pluripotent, will give rise to all the cells, all the tissues, all the organs of the uh, fetus. Embryonic stem cells are the ones, I think, that capture the imagination because of their enormous, um, uh, uh, their, this great ability to give rise to all these different lineages. So they're primitive, they're considered to be undifferentiated, they usually derive from the embryo but not exclusively. Uh, they have the potential to become a wide variety of specialized cell types. And these are the cells that all the fuss has been made of, both because of their therapeutic potential, but because of all the ethical issues that are raised uh, by uh, their creation and their use. Embryonic stem cells were first described in the early 1980s uh, by a, uh, a group at, in San Francisco and also by Martin Evans um, at that time working uh, in England and uh, for which he last year um, uh, gained the Nobel Prize in Medicine. Um, they are derived, as I said, from the inner cell mass and this shows the mouse going through a series of cell division. The inner met cell mass here is put on a special growth medium, grown, uh, uh, usually fed in a very special way, and then uh, will divide to form embryonic stem cells. And these, given the appropriate uh, nudge, so to speak, given the right chemical environment, can be driven to differentiate in various ways to more uh, complex, differentiated, specialized cell types. And this shows a, an early mouse embryo. Um, it goes through a series of cell divisions. Here it's at about the 8 to 16 cell stage. Uh, this then compacts. It then hollows out to form this cavity. And here we have the inner cell mass and surrounding it those trophoblast cells that will become placenta. But it's this tissue from which embryonic stem cells are most commonly formed. And it was several years after this had been uh, done in the mouse uh, by Gail Martin in, uh, in San Francisco, Martin Evans in London, that uh, a second type of stem cell was derived. And this was from the human. Um, and in the human, they were created in pretty much the same way. Um, human uh, blastocysts that were left over from an in vitro fertilization program were the inner cell mass cells were removed. They were placed on what was called a feeder layer of cells to give them nourishment, given special hormones in the medium. And then they form these colonies like this uh, from which uh, cell lines uh, can be derived. And these cells are very special. They'll proliferate indefinitely in culture. You can keep on growing them. This is very different from, say, skin cells if you try to grow those. Um, but these are the cells that, given the appropriate nudge, if you like, chemical, biochemical nudge, will differentiate into more specialized cells. What was odd about these cells, however, from the human, is that although in many ways they behaved like the mouse cells, they had very different requirements for growth, uh, and they had a number of other properties which distinguished them from the mouse cells. And we're only just really beginning to understand uh, what those differences are. Now, at the end we can perhaps talk about those, but they're really at the moment not too important from uh, the point of view of this lecture. Again, the promise of stem cell research, and I think all of us have heard it almost ad nauseum, is that they do have the potential to give rise to more specialized cells and therefore have sp conceivably can be used to replace damaged uh, sick or otherwise uh, tissues in a sense to rejuvenate. They are, in other words, uh, could be used as grafts in various tissues to cure various diseases, whether those are of injury or of aging or whatever. And so this is, in fact, uh, the major uh, concept, I think, that we're dealing with with human embryonic stem cells. 
but they also have other value. They could be look at for drug development and toxicity tests. They can be look at various experiments to study the development and, uh, of, of, uh, of particular tissues and gene control mechanisms that are involved and so on. So these cells have lots of use, but it's this part that captures, I think, the public imagination. Because clearly, if you can replace uh, a, a, a bone marrow where the bone marrow is, is uh, uh, damaged in some ways, and I'll show you an example later of where this may become possible, or replacing pancreatic islet cells that produce insulin, uh, then uh, these, the, the, this therapy has enormous potential. So, the real, and I say potential applications of embryonic stem cells Clearly, in transplantation medicine, bone marrow replacements, diabetes, Parkinson's disease, stroke, arthritis, multiple sclerosis, all these uh, are, are potential, uh, could be potentially treated by using grafts from, derived from uh, stem cells. And I say also for drug testing, and as I'll show you, possibly correcting some genetic diseases. And there are other uses as well, which I'm not going to go into tonight. But embryonic stem cells are controversial. They have primarily been derived from spare, by that I mean em uh, uh, embryos that are not going to be used in in vitro fertilization therapy. Um, there is the second one uh, I'll talk about in just a minute, and that's so-called therapeutic cloning, which is even more controversial. So the concern about creating embryonic stem cell lines is that the production of new human embryonic stem cells will involve the destruction of thousands of human embryos. Why do you need so many cell lines? Well, it's rather like asking a question, why do you need so many kidney types uh, for kidney transplants? And that is because these are derived, these will be foreign to the uh, individual, the patient who receives these cells, and so you would have to achieve a close genetic match for embryonic stem cells, just as you would for a kidney or any other transplantation technique. So you, you would, in theory, need to produce lots of different cell lines to provide a match uh, for a patient. However, as the facts are that, of course, every year hundreds of thousands of human embryos are created by in vitro fertilization. It's difficult for me to imagine uh, how this technique, which at one time was viewed by horror, uh, it was in the newspapers, Bob Edwards, who developed in vitro fertilization for humans, and in fact, with uh, Patrick Steptoe, created the first in vitro baby. Uh, was uh, a total pariah in Britain and all over the world, and now is a candidate for the Nobel Prize. Over three million babies have been created by in vitro fertilization worldwide. And this means that an enormous number, uh, that, but to obtain the eggs for in vitro fertilization, they are produced by what are called superovulation procedures. Most women undergoing IVF are super ovulated, they're given some hormones. So instead of ovulating a single egg, they uh, ovulate multiple eggs in a cycle. They can be fertilized in a test tube and the best embryos then chosen uh, to transfer to the mother. And as in most civilized countries, no more than two embryos are transferred, uh, then uh, the, the, clearly there are a lot of embryos that are spare, that are not going to be used and they are either thrown away or frozen away and rarely have much future uh, potential. So many more eggs are produced and fertilized and can be possibly used and the results are that embryos are discarded or stored indefinitely. So, there are some questions though obviously remaining in relationship to embryonic stem cells. And I'm not going to try and even give you my views on this. I'm merely just raising some of the questions to indicate that this is still a thorny type of issue. What is the status of a, 
uh, of a human embryonic stem cells are the equivalent of embryos, are the equivalent of people. Is a 64 cell embryo, a blastocyst, equivalent to a nine month fetus or for that, uh, uh, for that case a toddler? What are the objections to using spare embryos? Are there alternatives to using human embryonic stem cell lines for tissue replacement? Can human embryonic stem cells be produced by developing lines from a biopsy of an embryo rather than from the destruction of an embryo? In fact, they can be. Can embryos be created that lack any potential to develop into babies? Probably. Um, can stem cells be generated from somatic cells rather than from embryos? By somatic cells, I mean cells that are not part of the reproductive, the germ cell lineage that uh, is passed on from generation to generation. In other words, can we generate stem cells from skin or from any other type of cell? And it's that that I'm going to turn to towards the end of this talk. And at the moment, I think I'm losing power on this. Well, we'll see. We'll soldier on. Okay, now there is a second way potential way of creating human embryonic stem cells and this is by so-called therapeutic cloning. Now if you remember I said that embryonic stem cells, the ones that would be produced for, by IVF, are not genetically related to a potential patient or would be genetically, they certainly would be genetically dissimilar their degree of difference would vary and that's why you would need many cell lines to get a reasonably close match. But there is a way of getting cells that are genetically identical to a patient and this has been the most controversial aspect of uh, the stem cell area even though it's never been achieved. But that is by so-called therapeutic cloning and this has been done in the mouse um, but it takes us back to Dolly in 1997 when uh, Dolly, uh, of course, cl was cloned because this uh, did, uh, and I'll, show, I'll illustrate the relationship between this and therapeutic cloning over the next few slides. Let's recall how Dolly was created. Um, a black-faced sheep, these were Scottish sheep, but the, uh, the cells were grown and they were from the udder, they were from the mammary gland of, of a sheep. In fact, the sheep was dead by the time the, uh, the, the work was uh, uh, done on cloning. But it's possible to remove the nucleus uh, from the donor egg of this, uh, sorry, I'm getting mixed up, it was this one. There. Here we have the donor egg from the black face sheep. The nuclear material from that egg was removed and it was replaced by the nucleus from a, another sheep. In fact, in this case, uh, from a mammary gland cell. So now we have a somatic cell from uh, uh, the, the mammary tissue was placed in this enucleated egg. This was then given a sort of sharp shock that caused them to fuse. And then an embryo was developed from this without fertilization. And, uh, bec uh, and this embryo was implanted into uh, a surrogate mother here and we ended up here with a, a, a sheet that was essentially cloned uh, from this one here because it carried the nucleus of this sheep even though the egg was originally derived from this sheep. So this is what cloning is about. It's taking a nucleus from a somatic cell putting it into an oocyte which allowed that nucleus to be reprogrammed, it now becomes capable of giving rise to all the tissues of this lamb. And that's what we think of as cloning and I think that's what scares people a lot. All right, so now let's imagine that we're going to do this in the human. I should point out that this has not been done. But we have a patient here uh, some of this patient's cells are grown. Uh, a nucleus is removed and placed into an oocyte from which uh, uh, the nu it, whose nucleus has been removed. For those who are biologists, you know you're now going, you're putting in the case of a human, a diploid cell with 46 chromosomes in its nucleus. 
and you're removing this 23, this haploid, uh, that would normally be fertilized by sperm bringing in the other 23 chromosomes, but we're not doing that, we're just using this somatic cell nucleus, putting it in this oocyte. In theory, we could give rise to a blastocyst, and this blastocyst could now, the inner cell mass could be used to produce stem cells, and this has been done in the mouse. But it, but it has not been done in humor, but we could create now a stem cell lines, and these could then be used uh, appropriately to give rise to these specialized tissues, which now could be put back into the patient. So you see the idea here, you take skin cells or some other cells from the patient, the nuclei of those cells, which are genetically identical to the patient, will be put into an oocyte, that oocyte would be allowed to develop into an embryo, stem cells would be created, and now you have a source of tissue grafts which could be used in the patient and would match that patient identically. So how does this relate to human cloning? Well, in a sense it does. Um, it, uh, there was a lot of things talked about when uh, the people in Missouri voted on that amendment to the Constitution. Uh, one of them, one side said it's human cloning, the other side more or less said it wasn't human cloning, but it sort of was in a way because we, you have to use cloning technology to create a blastocyst which is genetically identical to the patient. Now the big difference, however, is that this is normal development, sexual reproduction of sperm fertilizes an egg, we get a zygote, we get a blastocyst, this would implant to give rise to a patient. In the case here, we're using a, this diploid cell from the patient, putting it into an oocyte, getting an embryo, creating stem cell lines. But in theory, this blastocyst could be implanted, and it would, in theory, be possible to clone this individual, the patient, now as a human being. Now, this is clearly illegal. It's also highly improbable. But nevertheless, this is, the, this is one aspect of therapeutic cloning which really scares people. But this is the valuable part, or potentially valuable part, because these cells could be put back into a patient without fear of rejection. So, there is a fear then that nuclear transplantation will be used to clone human babies. I, I don't think it's, I mean, but in theory this is a concern. There's a second concern which in many ways is probably uh, every bit as worrisome, and that is that the production of human embryonic stem cells by this somatic cell nuclear transfer, uh, you'd need lots of human eggs, and those human eggs would have to be derived from uh, women who were willing to undergo the superovulation treatment, which is not without risk, and there are all sorts of ethical concerns here about exploitation and so on in this. So this is a second concern with this. So there are contentious issues surrounding the whole embryonic stem cell uh, uh, field, if you like. The creation of embryonic stem cell lines requires destruction or partial destruction of embryos. Somatic cell nuclear transplantation skint involves cloning technology and the possibility of cloning a patient even though really this technology has not gone very far so far, uh, far. and skint somatic cell nuclear transfer requires lots of human eggs so let's just take a leap back and look at dolly again in the case of dolly we took a nucleus from a somatic cell, a, a mammary cell, and we put it into an oocyte, uh, that developed into an embryo and all the tissues associated with it. So that nucleus from that differentiated mammary cell had to be reprogrammed. It had to go from being a mammary cell to become a pluripotent cell. And how that occurred is there's something in the cytoplasm of an oocyte, of an egg, which must have allowed that nucleus to become reprogrammed. 
So reprogramming can uh, occur in various ways. Differentiated cells can revert to less differentiated cells on occasions. But it requires a radical change in the gene expression of the nucleus because this cells now become something quite different, having a different function. And the extreme example of this is in oocytes when the transferred somatic cell acquires the characteristic of a completely undifferentiated cell. So it's been reprogrammed to become pluripotent. So in somatic cell nuclear transfer, the cytoplasm of the egg must be able to completely reprogram the nucleus it receives from the somatic cell. And this requires lots of changes in the structure of the DNA, the protein around it, and so on. And this is still a very mysterious area, although I think scientists are now beginning to grasp some of the things that are going on. But it requires a very radical change. You know, we have something like 30,000 genes, um, of which in any tissue, only a fraction of those are going to be expressed. This requires a total reprogramming of that nucleus. So is there an alternative approach that could allow human stem cell lines to be created without dependence on human embryos or eggs? And will that approach allow the cell line to be matched genetically and immunologically to a patient? In other words, can we create patient-specific stem cells that could be used therapeutically? And in 19... Um, sorry, to show us how old I am. In 2006, two Japanese workers, led by uh, Shinya Yanamaka, reported in the, in the journal Cell the induction of pluripotent stem cells from mouse, embryonic, and adult fibroblasts. These are connective tissue cells by defined factors. And this... Um, the, the, uh, Yamanaka has this year won the uh, Lasker Award in biomedi uh, for biomedical research, uh, which will, is an indication within three years, this was a very special paper, and he will probably win uh, a Nobel Prize uh, quite shortly for this work. What he did was he, he took, he, he knew the genes that seem to be really characteristic of stem cells, of human and mouse pluripotent stem cells. And he chose a panel of 32 of those genes. And then he sort of, in various combinations, introduced them into skin cells of a mouse. And then he looked for the ability of these to uh, provide reprogramming, and in particular, colonies that look like embryonic stem cells. He introduced these genes by putting them in retrovirus, or special, in, into viruses. In fact, based on the HIV virus, although it was deactivated in various ways. But these, uh, uh, the, these viruses have the ability to infect cells and then become incorporated into the DNA. And he found that four genes, and here I just call them, they may not mean very much to you, but there's, uh, four genes were quite sufficient to allow these fibroblasts to become reprogrammed into colonies of cells that resembled embryonic stem cells. And they had the properties of embryonic stem cells, so-called stemness. The genes, uh, uh, many other, uh, many of the, all, all the other genes characteristic of stem cells started to be expressed. Uh, these cells were able to differentiate not just into fibroblasts, but into all sorts of different end cells, differentiated cells. They behaved just like embryonic stem cells. They formed what are called embryoid bodies, and I'll show you some later on. And teratomas, these are uh, tumors, solid tumors, in which all the different cell, uh, major cell layers of the body are represented. And they could also be incorporated back into embryos and give rise to pups. These cells have been shown to be capable of giving rise on their own to young. Um, but there were some problems. Some of the pups developed tumors. And one reason for this is that at least one of these genes, this C-MIC here, is a so-called oncogene, and if it's overexpressed, 
can drive cells to become tumorigenic. And this illustrates what may be one of the major problems of dealing with this type of therapy, that these cells can potentially, perhaps, cause tumors. Within a year, this was repeated, this work was uh, done or repeated in, with human cells. And they used the same um, group of genes, although other genes have been uh, used as well, but the four common ones again were the same. They were introduced into human fibroblasts, pluripotent stem cells arose, and these cells were very similar in all their properties. They weren't identical, but very similar in their properties to human embryonic stem cells. So we've now gone from reprogramming a mouse cell to reprogramming a human cell. And so clearly it would be possible to take a skin biopsy from me, uh, introduce these genes, within three to four weeks produce a stem cell line and use those cells, differentiate them towards say a tissue, a nerve cell, and introduce them back into me uh, as a patient. So, there are potentially, therefore, two kinds of patient-specific pluripotent stem cell. The ones that are produced by somatic cell nuclear transfer, so-called therapeutic cloning, in which a body cell is introduced into, to create here a blastocyst identical to the patient genetically, create stem cells that way. That's never actually been done, as I said. It's been done in the mouse, it's been done in other species, but not so far in the, in the human. Or, or nuclear reprogramming in which we introduce a small number of genes, uh, these are inserted, reprogramming occurs, and stem cells can be produced. So clearly there's a lot of excitement with this, partly because this is producing stem cells without embryos. And it's taken me a long time to get round to this topic, but this is really the crux of what I'm uh, talking to you about tonight. So, these have many potential advantages, both political and scientific. They're not derived from embryos, and they're not derived by cloning technologies. And most importantly, they could be created in a matter of weeks and matched to a patient. And in fact, it was, I say, just over three years since the Yamanaka paper appeared but this, this technology has caught on. There are papers appearing just about every week on it. And this just illustrates the potential of the technology. We have here induced pluripotent stem cells which have been created from patients with spinal muscular atrophy. This has been done now for a whole group of these patients. It's a, 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 it's a disease of motor neurons. And this just illustrates that, in, uh, uh, that it's possible, and this was a control uh, patient here, this was a patient with the disease, that it is possible to reprogram these cells and also to create neurons from both these patients. If these cells could be corrected, if the genetic, um, if, if, if the gene which, causes, which is responsible for this disease could be corrected, then you would have a potential ability to introduce, um, if you like, genetically modified cells that are now in which, the delete, in which the gene mutation has been corrected could be introduced back into a patient. In fact, there has been success in the mouse. Um, a mouse, uh, mouse models for, um, in this case, for sickle cell anemia. Skin cells were created. They were reprogrammed by the four factors I mentioned. Stem cells were created. The mutation was corrected. It's a simple point mutation, and it was possible to correct, put a correct gene back into these cells. Uh, and the, so the mutation was corrected. These are genetically, correct, uh, genetically corrected induced pluripotent stem cells here. These were differentiated into cells of the hematopoietic lineage. They were introduced back into the mouse, and it was possible to cure this mouse. And this, this is a paper that's appeared within about the last eight months from Janisch's group 
uh, to MIT. So this is quite remarkable. I think it shows the potential of this technology. Um, this shows another disease. Uh, and this is Fanconi's anemia. This is a, a disease in which there is um, instability of the chromosomes. And there are various uh, uh, outcomes of this. But it's a, a, a disease which uh, will ultimately, um, the patient will not survive. It's bone marrow failure. It's a failure to repair chromosomal damage. It occurs in various forms. And in fact, again, um, and I won't go through what these are, uh, are but cells were taken. Uh, these cells were uh, corrected, or, uh, and they were, they were corrected actually at this stage. These induced pluripotent stem cells are created, and the corrected cells are now there, if you like, in gene banks for several patients. But it has not been possible at the moment to use these therapeutically for the simple reason that there is here potential safety concerns. You may recall uh, about 10 years ago, gene therapy was used on a patient at the University of Pennsylvania using a, a virus to introduce uh, and hopefully cure this individual, and the patient died. And it set back the field enormously because it was very clear that, um, that the the therapy went ahead without a thorough review of the possible consequences to the patient. And one of the real concerns with this, um, uh, with this, uh, with this technology is how do we make these cells safe? Um, how, there, are one is, uh, there are other aspects, of course. How do we di direct the differentiation uh, efficiently to give us the precursor cells we need to affect a cure? And how do we deliver them uh, efficiently to, uh, for tissue repair? I think all these can be um, overcome relatively easy. But how do we make these cells safe? Let me indicate the problems. One is that we are using genes which are potentially oncogenes. And we have little control over the way they're expressed when the reprogramming occurs, or whether those uh, genes will continue to be expressed as the cells differentiate. The other is we're using viruses which integrate into DNA, cause breaks, cause mutations, and so on, which also could potentially cause muta uh, uh, mutations that would lead, among other things, to cancer. So there are, uh, that they, I, although I think this area is very exciting, um, there are still questions arising. Are all these cells truly pluripotent? Can we, we use them to create any tissue we want? Are they equivalent to embryonic stem cells? They're probably not identical, but they're certainly very similar. Will they work in tissue transplantation? Probably. Can they reprogramming genes be silenced or removed? And will the lentiviral vectors, which insert efficiently but relatively randomly, cause mutations? But this field is moving so rapidly that the technology is changing almost week by week. In fact, it's rather frightening to be in the area because, you know, any good idea you may have, someone else has certainly had, and the real question is, can they do it faster than you can? And in the long run, it becomes a horribly competitive area, which is good in some ways, not so good in others. But over the last year, uh, reprogramming has been achieved with fewer genes and with small molecule uh, additives. Pharmacological inhibition of pathways driving differentiation have been found to be effectively increase the efficiency of this, uh, of the process of reprogramming. Cells other than fibroblasts have been used, umbilical cord cells, for example. We've recently grown umbilical cord cells from piglets and reprogrammed them, so it's now possible to take, have those cells genetically match to a pig, for example, which uh, will go on. And you could put a graft in and see how the graft does. Um, single vectors now, instead of multiple viruses, single vectors carrying multiple genes. And also, there are ways now of removing those genes. And I won't go into that from those cells once you've reprogrammed them. Um, 
avoidance of lentiviruses altogether and in fact the use of plasmid these are other kinds of things that can carry genes into cells which don't actually have to integrate into the genome they just carried along for a while they're expressed reprogramming goes on and then they get diluted out um, it's also quite recently been possible to transfect somatic cells with just the proteins not the genes just putting the proteins in and this is happening as I say almost daily it's uh, it, 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 it's really quite frightening uh, but also good because I think we're going to see within the next two years the ability to reprogram cells probably entirely pharmacologically so why did I, why was I interested in pigs uh, well partly you saw I was from a division of animal sciences my science has mainly been with livestock or I've worked a long time with human embryonic stem cells but the objective in my lab was to establish these induced pluripotent stem cells from a pig by doing this using the same technologies that have been used with the mouse and with the human and why would you want to do this well one is it hadn't been done before there's always this challenge in science of doing it before other people because embryonic stem cells have never been created they've been reported from pigs and cows over 15 years but they've never been created and certainly induced pluripotent stem cells have not but the major reason for doing it was the pig is an ideal model in many ways for the human its physiology its immunology its anatomy uh, its digestive system is very similar to that of the human so to study the efficiency and the outcome of stem cell transplantation in a model other than the mouse the mouse isn't too good I mean for example the, the mouse heart beats about 500 times a minute it's difficult to do a lot of experiments uh, working with this sort of small system pigs big okay uh, but it would be possible as I said and we've done this to create uh, induced pluripotent stem cells from a particular animal conduct tissue transplants on the same pig a few months later and follow the success of the transplant over the course of months or even years and it would be a particularly valuable advance for human medicine human medicine right now needs models to test these out so a good reason for looking at the pig is that you could do this sort of experiment and also as um, uh, as many uh, phys physicians are aware the pig is used very widely uh, for surgical techniques uh, for, uh, uh, for for example transplantation work and so on is done extensively in the pig there are other reasons as well we could clonally propagate animals it would have value in agriculture and we could also knock in and knock out genes and again I'm not going to go into those aspects uh, of why we're working with pigs but let me you know I'm trying to justify my own work but let me say I think there are justifications for doing this there's nothing uh, shall we say what we're doing is is building on the technology developed by others but the University of Missouri does have a, 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 is a national center from NIH for looking at pigs as models for human disease so it's a good place to do it so my our initial aims were to introduce pluripotent genes into porcine fibroblasts uh, our second aim was to confirm that these cells met the criteria of being pluripotent in their general properties and these would include this ability to proliferate indefinitely uh, express the genes believed to be necessary for pluripotency and exhibit pluripotency in their ability to form embryoid bodies which are these little differentiated tissues that can form and teratomas which are these solid tumors which uh, contain tissues representative of the whole body I won't go into this in any detail we uh, developed our own vectors at this time uh, because they weren't uh, uh, available uh, uh, they are now can be purchased we made these pseudoviruses put them into the cells and then uh, the cells then sort of they stick to the dish initially they spread they're what are typically fibroblast like cultures but then they start to round up and grow like crazy but then after about 
Three weeks colonies formed and these were positive for a marker called alkaline phosphatase. They were positive for other markers for pluripotent stem cells. And they, these colonies, to all intents and purposes, look very similar to human embryonic stem cells. And I won't go into this uh, uh, other than to indicate that a number of cells that we expect to be associated with pluripotency uh, were present and expressed in these cells. They also had a normal, some of them had a normal carrier type. The viruses apparently not caused chromosomal breakage. Um, they were also high in an enzyme called telomerase, which you may have heard of because the Nobel Prize for Medicine this year was given to uh, Elizabeth Blackburn and her ex-student and a, another, uh, a, a, another individual uh, for discovering telomerase. This is the enzyme that keeps the end of the, your chromosomes young and healthy. And these are high in these uh, pluripotent cells, whereas they're very low in the cells from which they were derived. And I won't go into this any further other than to show you the last slide here, which uh, indicates that these cells, were, when they were introduced into a, a, an immunodeficient mice, were capable of forming tumors, teratoma, solid tumors, and these had representatives. Here is, for example, striated muscle. Uh, here are some ciliated cells, representative of various types of tissue that would be found in the, uh, in the, uh, in the pig. So these cells were pluripotent. They, uh, they appear to show all the properties of pluripotent cells. Uh, we've gone on since then and used a whole uh, variety of other ways, but I think it's now possible to go ahead, uh, create patient or pig-specific stem cells, and start to do transplants to see if they form tumors or if they're safe, see if these transplants are functional, and to see if uh, the techniques involved in introducing them into the animal can be improved so that the grafts take, take efficiently. And so with that, I'm going to close. And I have a fairly small group of people working on this, just really largely done by my associate, been with me for many years, Toshihiko Azashi, um, who is uh, a, a really terrific scientist a postdoc here who's been in my lab just over a year, and my technician who does the stem cell cultures. So this has been a, a, a pretty intensive endeavor over the last 18 months to get these uh, cells to work. Uh, we've been funded by the NIH and also by the state of Missouri. Um, and uh, it's, I think, reaching a point where induced pluripotent stem cells, I think, are at the point where it may be close to be able to use these therapeutically, or at least test their, uh, uh, their safety and therapeutic potential in model animals such as the pig. Thank you. Are there any questions? I should point out about three years ago, I gave a lecture, I think out at Kreft Kur or somewhere here. It was during, you know, let's educate everybody about stem cells and it was to a chamber of commerce uh, group and a lady came up to me after it and she said, you know, that was wonderful. I loved hearing you talk and it was really interesting but I really didn't understand a word of it. And so I hope at least, you know, I made it reasonably comprehensible. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed that. I learned a lot. Uh, two maybe technical questions just to ask you. Um, when they, when they, uh, make, when they make, uh, make embryonic stem cells from inner cell mass, it has to be on a feeder layer of some kind. Otherwise, they form embryonic bodies. Yeah. Uh, how does that work with the IPS? Okay. The question was, uh, when embryonic st uh, stem cells are made from embryos from the inner cell mass, they're grown on a feeder layer of, we, of irradiated, usually irradiated fibroblasts. You have to give them something those cells are producing, but you don't want those cells to take over. So they're irradiated, so they can't proliferate, but they produce it. In fact, the same technology is used with our pig cells. We use irradiated mouse embryonic fibroblasts. Uh, they grow on those, or you could use the medium from those cells. And, and, uh, but those cells are producing various factors. 
which along with, we add for our cells a, a hormone called uh, fibroblast growth factor 2 or basic fibroblast growth factor. And that plus what these cells are producing um, plus some other things uh, that are added, um, uh, transferrin and some other proteins, they, they, that's enough to allow these cells to grow. In the mouse, things have got a lot further along. And in fact, uh, mouse embryonic uh, stem cells are, can be grown without uh, a fetal layer by using a, a, a hormone called leukemia inhibitory factor. And in fact, we've created recently pig ones which appear to be like the mouse ones. There's always been the controversy. Mouse ones are somewhat different from the, the, the human ones, and they certainly behave differently. But it's now by uh, playing around with inhibitors and so on, we're beginning to see we can create similar cells in mouse and human, and, and also in the pig from these uh, induced pluripotent cells. Another question. I'll not answer the last part, but um, most of the diseases we're talking about, whether it's Parkinson's and in some, to some extent type 2 diabetes, um, arthritis, many of these diseases that could be treated with stem cells are diseases of aging. And even if you replace one part you're going to have, uh, you're still going to age. Um, I, I mean, I, I think we have to face that. I think what we're looking at here is the ability in, uh, to treat certain patients who, uh, who, whose life style and life could be prolonged in a, in a way that would be uh, good for society as well as good for them. Um, I don't want to get into that, that's the whole ethics, but certainly yes, I'm not sure about uh, all these diseases, it's going to depend upon safety issues, it's going to depend upon whether these cells function correctly, although we saw in the case of the uh, mouse uh, uh, that uh, where we corrected a hemoglobin molecule that it was possible to restore uh, 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 normal physiological function to that mouse. But yes, I think that I hate to put a timeline on it, you know, there's always this danger, I mean, in fact, everything gets so hyped, uh, you know, we're going to cure this, we're going to do that, and of course it's the way that scientists get funded in the long run, they have to convince politicians that they're doing something useful, and they might prolong the life of that politician. So it's, uh, uh, so there is, um, you know, there is this tendency to exaggerate potential, but nevertheless, uh, I think that it's uh, feasible, particularly with this technology, rather than therapeutic cloning, to be able to do some of those things. But whether, to what extent, you know, a cure will be affected on an aging individual, I think is going to very much depend upon that individual uh, and, and the various, uh, you know, uh, various other complicating issues. I mean. We don't just get old in one thing, we get old in a lot of, uh, in a, a way, almost simultaneously. But yeah, I, th I think this, there is potential here. Yeah? How do a young man that had Cronin's disease, he was about 15, now he's not an aging individual, but he was Absolutely, absolutely. Do you think anything like this could be held accountable for a 15-year-old that has something like that? That's really why I came to find um, that. I think so. I mean, I, you know, I'm not here to, uh, to be able to, I'm not a soothsayer, I can't uh, no, I predict think. these things. But I would see that the major priority with these cures would be for individuals who have, if you like, uh, these at uh, an early age. Um, and some of them, I mean, certainly type 1 diabetes, the ability to create islets, for example, producing insulin, 
if provided they can be reintroduced uh, in, a, in a manner that they would survive those cells would obviously have enormous potential. And I say in this case you would not require, uh, 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 you would have a close genetic match, you would have an gen identical match. And uh, certainly um, cells that produce insulin have been produced from embryonic stem cells. Some other types of diseases, autoimmune diseases, similar to the one you mentioned, may be more complicated because that's an attack, after all, on the, uh, on the individual's own cells. But certainly there again, replacing cells would be uh, potentially possible. Thank you. Yes. I think it's too far out. I mean, uh, to do that, you have to, the correction has to go through the germline. In other words, it has to appear in the sperma or in the eggs of that individual. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there are ways, but that may be done more effectively by some sort of gene therapy that's targeted to the gonads, for example, or, uh, and so on. But, yeah, I mean, clearly there are those, but I see those things as being... A, a, a longer way away. Any other questions? Okay. Um, the question was the teratoma, the section I showed, that was from a single teratoma. Uh, what we wanted to see and fortunately found was that, the, that multiple types of tissue were present in that teratoma and that indicated those cells. It is in many ways the gold standard of pluripotency, that is you can produce the three major germ cell layers and the differentiated derivatives of those within a tumor. If the tumor had been less differentiated we'd have been a lot more concerned but this is as I say the uh, made a gold standard for pluripotency. Um, that, uh, that was a very odd tumor because we'd injected it under the skin of the mouse and then they'd appeared in the peritoneum. But they were pig. I mean, we, they weren't mouse tumors. Um, but they, they uh, and there were several teratomas formed in that particular case. Normally a single teratoma forms just under the skin uh, and it just forms a lump. It doesn't bother the mouse. And, uh, and, and, and our protocols mean that we, the mouse is sacrificed long before it becomes, causes distress or, or apparently pain. Oh, um, well, I mean, of course, if it were humans, and this is, well, in the case of humans, of course, cord blood now is, in many cases, is, is, is taken because um, uh, people have been doing this now for several years, frozen away and put away because they see the future as possibly being able to use it. Well, I'm doing it with pigs. So it's, uh, you just go out and uh, you, when a pig's born, you take a piece of umbilical cord, you try and clean it as much as you can, bring it back, and you just gr then start to grow out the various cell types from there. And the advantage of the umbilical cord is that many people believe that there are stem cells there to start off with. They're not pluripotent, but there are, they can differentiate. And these are young cells, so they haven't, uh, they can grow, you can grow very vigorously in culture. We just get them at birth. Well, why can't you get money now to start donating their umbilical um, I think that uh, this has been done. There is a group out at the University of California, San Diego, doing this now routinely, yeah. that women... Um, you know, it depends who you say is, owns the, the umbilical cord, is it the child or the mother, but nevertheless, 
the umbilical cord can, is being, uh, are being harvested, cells are being grown and put away. And the, it is possible to create from, and it's been done now in large number. The, in fact, we were just starting to do it in the pig when the paper appeared on doing it in the human. We thought we were smarter than that, but we're not, we never. And um, so, the, yeah, so w this is being done, and I think will be done routinely, because it isn't difficult to create these cells. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to get into that. I mean, there are, yeah, there are problems, of course, with tissues. Is tissues, as soon as they're removed, as soon as tissues start to die, they degrade. And so there do become problems with that. Can't see very much up here. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. You mentioned how many cells, different kinds of cells there are in the body. What kind is it? 280 and 250? Do people know or do you know? Well, the, prop, the question was how many different sorts of cells are in the human body. I mean, you can, it depends how you classify them. You know, is this motor neuron the same as that or is it subtly different? Um, that's just a guess. Somewhere between 200 and and 250 and 300 major cell types. But within all of those, you're going to get more or less different ones that perhaps have specific function or in a different geographical place. So that, that's a real problem, you know. How, uh, the, most therapies will involve the precursors to these cells, which are then put in the right place and you hope they will develop. And that, of course, is the crux. Will they develop properly? Um, but so uh, will they do their function when they're there? But that's just a rough estimate. Nobody really knows how many different cell types. It's just that some people say 250, some say 280, some say 300. But it's in that range. But within those, you may well have further subdivisions. Yeah. Mm. See Mick. Yeah, yeah, the real question is, why did those work? Why did he choose these 30 genes and come up with those four? Well, he came up with the four from the 30 because they happened to work. Some of the other combinations didn't work. He didn't use all the combinations, but he used them. Now, the reason he, uh, OC4, for example, is a, a so-called transcription factor. It lives in the nucleus. It turns on and off certain genes. But it's only found in very uh, in undifferentiated cells. It's found in, 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 in cells that give rise to the germ cells in, 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 the, in the male uh, germline. It's found in embryos in the inner cell mass and in the very early embryo as it developed. And it's also found in embryonic stem cells. It's the only place OCT4 is really expressed. Uh, some of the others are spread around a little more, but for the most part, there's a spectrum of genes that are expressed in embryonic stem cells. So he says, well, why don't we just upregulate those genes and see what happens? And in fact, it happened. He created embryonic stem cells with that particular combination. Other combinations have also been used. Just about all of them have this gene OP4 in there, but there are other combinations as well. And quite recently, uh, reprogramming certain cells has just been achieved with two genes. And as I say, I think it will be achieved fairly soon uh, by pharmacological methods. Yeah, one more. One more. Uh, embryonic stem cells, I'm concerned about. If you had a mom there from one parent, and the mom developed Yeah, the embryonic stem cells are, are very small cells, actually. They're about 8 to 10 micrometers across. They've got a very big nucleus. That means you couldn't see them, but they form colonies. The colony I showed you at the beginning was about a millimeter and a half across. Um, in other words, it would be visible to the naked eye, the colony. But you, everything is done under the microscope because you're really looking at 
have to look at individual cells and what individual cells are doing. So uh, you can create these colonies uh, which are visible, but they're made up of many thousands of cells. What are the, 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 the question is, what are the similarities and differences between induced pluripotent stem cells and embryonic stem cells? And this is something that's just been looked at. In fact, I have a paper on my desk right now to review on this. But um, there are differences. There are differences, slight differences in the way the cells behave and look. But um, the major differences that have been sound so far is in the so-called epigenetic differences, the way that different chemical groups have been put on the DNA and the associated histones and so on. There are also some differences in the pattern, of, uh, in the gene expression patterns. But also I should stress that different embryonic stem cell lines aren't identical either. So there's a, there's a whole spectrum in both. But there, are, there do appear to be some distinctions, but they're not very sharp distinctions. Yeah, Janet? How much is it known about the immune cells? Well, we do know that, uh, that uh, if you're going to have graphs to work, um, you have to put them either in a, an area where the immune system doesn't get at them very easily, for example, in the eye. And this is uh, one thing I forgot to mention in the lecture is that it is now possible, there are n new gene therapy trials going on for a couple of retinal degeneration diseases. Uh, one, is, well, one is going ahead and another one is being proposed. Because you can put in cell, these are not the induced pluripotent cells, this is embryonic cells. Because you can put those in the eye and they won't get rejected. But they are rejected as grafts just as other foreign grafts are. Um, but, uh, but of course, by matching closely, you'll, evo uh, you'll avoid rejection and you'll also avoid that graft sort of taking over as well um, because, you know, it's two-way street. The graft can attack the mother, I mean, can attack the patient just as the patient can attack the graft. Okay, I think that's it.